Okay, we just want to uh, thank everyone for their prayers and that we were able to make it back um, safely from our trip to uh, see our daughter and uh, all went well while we were there. Um, uh, at this time, let us notice page 148. Page 148. I keep falling in love with him. All who have it, let us see. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He keeps blessing me over and over and over and over and over again. He keeps blessing me over and over and over and over and over over again he gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by oh what a love between my lord and i i keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again he keep cleansing me over and over and over and over and over again. He keeps cleansing me over and over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. Shall we pray? pray. Heavenly Father, it's once again that we come before your throne, Heavenly Father, just giving you all the glory and praise and honor due unto you, Heavenly Father. We want to just give you thanks, Heavenly Father, that yet you've given us another day, another day of life, Heavenly Father, another day, Heavenly Father, for us to examine ourselves, to see whether we we're in the faith, to make any corrections or errors that we need, I mean changes that we need to in our lives, Heavenly Father. And we just want to say thank you, and we want to say thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving your son on our behalf, dearly Father. We come now, dearly Father, at this time as we prepare to go into our Wednesday night study. We ask, dearly Father, that you will be with your man servant, that he may recall the things that he has studied, that he may bring forth, break forth, dearly Father, your word, uh, dearly Father, unto us. We pray, dearly Father, that this word that we hear tonight will be edifying and building up for us, dearly Father, as we are here on this Christian journey. We pray, dimly Father, that that same word will prick us in the heart if we find, dimly Father, yet that we're not doing those things that we need to do. We just ask, dimly Father, that you continue to bless us, to continue to be with us uh, as we go through this lesson. In your son Jesus' name, we give thanks and praise. Amen. Appreciate the song and the prayer, brother, brother Tony. And it's good to see you, brother Tony and sister Leida back. Amen. Good to see you guys. We love you guys and miss you. And it is always good uh, to see the saints back in the house. All the saints, actually. Let me not get in trouble. Uh, but that, that applies to everyone. Uh, just uh, before we get started in the lesson, I wanted to kind of bring us back and let us know why we are on this particular study. It's called or titled Doctrines of Men. And although it seems like we've kind of landed in, a, in the midst of a, a somewhat extended sidebar, I wanted to uh, remind everyone of why we are doing this study and where we're going. Uh, this, the origins of this study are rooted in some doctrines that are going around right now and it's not uh, limited to the Hebrew Israelites, but uh, some of their doctrines, at least in 
uh, black and brown communities are some of the doctrines that uh, initiated this, uh, this study. As we said in the introduction, it is not designed for us to argue or debate anyone, um, but it is looking at some of the things that they are teaching, particularly to black and brown youth, and it has to do with their views on uh, people of other ethnicities and uh, how uh, they are teaching a doctrine that uh, we believe is false, regardless of uh, the atrocities or sin, which is what we understand it to be, that happened in the uh, European slave trade and, and, and all of that, and that, that we all, I think, everyone detests. Uh, but to come up with a doctrine that excludes people based on the color of their skin is simply just false. And while this uh, lesson series isn't centered on that, uh, we wanted to use that somewhat as a backdrop to begin uh, this study. So that, a lot of that is covered in the first lessons when we looked at the origins of some of these groups. And we began to look at the law, the, right off the bat, uh, what was the relationship to the law uh, as it uh, relates to the purpose or of our salvation. That was part three. Then we looked at the 39 Melicote in the cornfield. We did an overview of Genesis, Exodus, and Leviticus because a lot of these groups are Torah-based or Old Testament-based. So uh, that's where we're going. We're, we're, we're meeting people where they are so that we can uh, look at it and, be, and, and design this uh, series of lessons so that uh, the common person, the Christian, can look at the Old Testament and begin to understand uh, where there is truth, obviously, but then where there is doctrinal error. Uh, so then we began to do a review in part six. We had a homework refresher, part seven. We had a homework assignment, part eight. And then part nine, we did an extensive look at, well, not extensive. All, all of these are somewhat brief, as we mentioned before, but we looked at off offerings and sacrifices. And then starting in part 10, we started to look at Jesus. <clears throat> And I thought it was always a very interesting uh, discussion that Jesus had uh, with a, a Samaritan woman. And that took us back in part 11 to look at Mount Gerizim, Mount Ebal, and, and Shechem. And then we began to look at Jesus' uh, quotes in Deuteronomy, those to the devil, and we will be going back there today, actually. And then look at Jesus in a brief introduction to New Testament and Old Testament allusions that occur in Deuteronomy. The reason why we're spending this time in Deuteronomy because Deuteronomy 28, 68, when we get there, is one of the key verses that they use to try to uh, say that the uh, European slave trade was something that was predicted in the scriptures, and that's what they begin to offer as a reason why they should hate certain people, or whatever the doctr doctrinal basis are. Um, and then in part 14, you see where we were staying in Deuteronomy. And if you notice, we're working our way through. And the reason why I'm slowing down to give this kind of a recap is because we don't want to get lost in terms of where we're going. We know where we're going. There's a, there's a purpose. There's a method to the madness. But we didn't want to just jump right into Deuteronomy 28. When we uh, get to Deuteronomy 28, we want to understand uh, what is happening? We, we see that Moses now is 120 years old in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, he is not allowed to see the promised land. He is now speaking to a bunch of millennials, all the people that were there uh, at Sinai in Exodus, uh, where they received the Torah or received the law or the instructions. They have died off. And then we found in uh, Deuteronomy chapter number five, we found a gem where Moses now repeats uh, the Ten Commandments, but he does it with 38 years of experience. So Deuteronomy chapter number five is not an exact uh, recitation of the law. We know that the law was given some 38 years later back in Exodus chapter number 20. So we were not doing a comparison between Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy chapter number five, but we were looking at it from Moses' experience now as an old man, and he's teaching these young people about the Ten Commandments. So we went through uh, that, and I, I hope that that was somewhat uh, of a edifying uh, mini-series there. And then part chapter number, uh, that led us up through part 21. Part 21, we jumped into Deuteronomy 6, which is Shema Yisrael, which is uh, something that the 
Israelites were required to do at every morning and evening service. It involved three separate passages. It started off with Deuteronomy chapter number 6, uh, verse 4 through 9. Then it went into Deuteronomy chapter number 11. And then it went into Numbers chapter 15. And we noticed there the emphasis that God placed on teaching the children. So that was part 21. Part 22, uh, we looked at, uh, we were intending to look at Deuteronomy 7 through 9, but I think we pretty much stayed in Deuteronomy chapter number 7. And so right now down in part 23, uh, we're going to be in Deuteronomy chapter number 8. And the theme, this is my writing here down at the bottom, was don't forget about me. If you looked at all 20 verses of Deuteronomy chapter number 8, it is God imploring the people not to forget about him. And I think that this is extremely applicable to us today, and that's why we're going to spend a little bit of time on it. And then also we're going to look at where Jesus quotes uh, Deuteronomy chapter number 8, uh, several times in, uh, in Matthew and Luke's uh, writings. So generally speaking, if we looked at an overview of the book of Deuteronomy, uh, this is a, a general uh, outline. You see the three addresses of Moses. And right here in red, we're at the one, uh, chapter 8, verse 1 through 20, the warning about forgetting the Lord. That's where we are right now. And you can see the previous lesson was, uh, that God wanted them to be separate. And so once again, we see a lot of these uh, principles still applying to us today. So with that, there are some key texts um, that we want to make note of. I don't think we'll get to uh, verse 11 and 16, uh, but they're there for your, for your uh, understanding. Um, let's go now over to uh, Deuteronomy chapter number 8. I think I had changed this slide a little bit. Yeah, I did. So we're going to have to wing it tonight, brethren. <laughs> it looks like I gave Brother Keith. Uh, hold on one second. It looks like I gave Brother Keith the, maybe the older version of this. Let me see. Let me see. No, we're good. We're good. Okay. So what I'm going to do is just pass that and start right here. Deuteronomy chapter number 8, let's look at verse number 1 and 2. And the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. Verse 2, and ye shall remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to what? Humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart. Where, whether thou wouldest keep his, his commandments or not. Hold up, wait a minute. God just said something, Brother Tony. We know why they ended up wandering in the wilderness, because they doubted God. But God could have ended that after six months, one year, two years, whatever. We also know that he was not going to allow anybody with that attitude to inherit the kingdom. So we know some things, but look at what is said here in verse 2 that there were three things. Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to do what? Humble to humble the people. And to do what? To prove, thee. to prove thee. And to do what? To know what was, to know what was in thine That's why, Brother Tony, I don't like to rush through those texts. Think about those things. God was doing something even when it seemed like he wasn't doing anything. We will do a lesson one day on the wilderness. Because although they're walking in that wilderness, all God was trying to humble them. God was trying to, Brother Keith, you, you catch it? He was trying to prepare them. He was trying to prove them. And he wanted to know what's really in your heart. I'm going to let you struggle is what you get out of the text. I'm going to let, I want to see what, let me see if I got some Job's in this group. Let me see if I have some faithful people in this group. 
Let me see, Israel, what you are made of. So we're going to have a little test in this wilderness. We're going to pick up on this a little bit later. Down here in, I guess you could call it orange, or just a few places that I mentioned, <clears throat> not, not me, I'm sorry, a few references that go back to verse number two. For the Lord thy God hath blessed thee in all thy works of thy hand. He knoweth thy walking through the great wilderness. These 40 years the Lord thy God hath been with thee, that thou hast what? Lack nothing. Lack nothing. So even though they were being tested, they were being proved, and God wanted to know them. They didn't lack anything. So even today, sometimes, when we are still in our fog of life, when we're still going through problems we don't understand, maybe we're walking in that wilderness, maybe we're praying to God, maybe we're wondering why our prayers haven't been answered, yet God is still providing for us. God is still providing for us even though we think he's not there. He's right there with us. Amos, many years and centuries later, remembered this. And he says, and also I brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. Uh, Exodus 16.3 this is having to do when uh, the people were, this is actually before, this would be 38 years before Deuteronomy chapter number 8, verse number 3, where you can see where God was telling them what he was going to do. Uh, and then, and same with Exodus 16, 12, God was telling them what he was going to do. And then in Exodus 16, 35, the same thing. And the children of Israel did eat manna uh, 40 years until they came to the land inhabited. They did eat manna until they came into the borders of the land of Canaan. Why do you put this in there, Brother Williams? Because now, Brother Tony, in Deuteronomy, they stopped getting manna because God was going to allow them to eat or feed off of the land that he had promised them. In other words, God was still providing, but just in a different way. And sometimes we want God to keep giving us that manna, man. We, we become accustomed to that manna. That's what we feel we need. God says, no, I'm still going to provide for you, but now you're going to eat off of the blessings that I have placed you in. I think this is, again, out of place, brethren. Let me come back to this. Let's go to Deuteronomy 8, 4. Thy raiment waxed not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these 40 years. In other words, you're out in the desert, you're wandering, but you're relatively healthy. You're relatively healthy. You don't have swollen feet. Your shoes are fine. Obviously, these are metaphors for a life that, that God had been taking care of them. Uh, uh, Nehemiah 9.21, Nehemiah recalls the 40 years of manna. Let's go into Deuteronomy 8.5 now. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasten his son, so the Lord thy God chasten thee. Look at what's happening in Deuteronomy. And this is where... We were, we're, we're, we're trying to recognize in many, many cases where Jesus and Paul are quoting Deuteronomy or they're quoting the Old Testament. They're New Testament principles, but they were derived in the Old Testament. That the Lord, uh, thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasten his son, this is Deuteronomy, chasten his son, so the Lord thy God chasten thee. Same thing, 2 Samuel 7, 14, Nathan recounts God's promise of building the house for himself and the chastening of the people for iniquity. I didn't put all of that in there because I think it would have been too much and it would probably would have pulled us a little bit off of the off a topic. But in 2 Samuel 7, 14, Nathan doesn't quote Deuteronomy chapter 8 to King David, but he talks to God, talks about God correcting the people for their iniquity. Uh, Psalms 89, verse 20 to 37, I did put all of this in there, uh, and the reason I did, because it talks about chastening, but it also gives us a foreshadow of Christ Jesus 
and uh, the promise to David. So let me read this, but let's try not to allow, us, allow it to pull us off of where we're going in Deuteronomy 8.5. Uh, Psalms 89, verse 20, I have found David my servant with the holy oil have I anointed him, with whom my hand shall be established. Mine arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his place and the plague that hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. And in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand also in the sea and his right hand in the rivers. He shall cry unto me, thou art my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also will I put my, also will I make him my firstborn. If y'all even know anything about the Hebrew letter, uh, uh, when it talks about Christ being the, the first fruits or the firstborn, that word in Hebrew is protococcus. We remember that. It's where we get the word prototype. But verse 27, again, of Psalms 89, also I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep from him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever. And his throne, he's talking about Jesus now. He's he's using it in the context of David, but it's talking about Jesus. And his throne as the days of heaven. If his children, verse 30 is where I want to go into 32. If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with what? The rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Lord have mercy. That is a, that is a sermon on top of a sermon. But you look at how that correlates back to Deuteronomy chapter number 8, verse number 5. And we're going to get over into uh, Luke in a minute. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasing his son, so the Lord thy God chasten thee. Don't forget about me is the thing that God is saying. And sometimes when we forget about God, sometimes we're going to go through some things. And that may happen even if you are walking godly. You're still going to go through some things. But we'll talk about the purpose of that a little bit later. And then he finished out about his uh, uh, holiness that was sworn, and he will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. Selah. I love that Psalms 89. It's a beautiful passage. Um, Proverbs 3. Verse number 12, for whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, the son in whom he delights. Now, for this part, I just brought this lesson in. We're going to open it up for some conversation here right now. But I'm going back to our church discipline study. Because Deuteronomy chapter number 8 is quoted in the New Testament. Deuteronomy chapter number 8, verse 5 is quoted in Hebrews chapter 12. But that lesson came in part seven. Remember, we have uh, part seven, lessons one, two, and three. And we looked at the God of discipline and how God disciplines us. Brother Williams, how does this apply to everything that we're looking at? Because the Hebrew Israelites and some of these people believe that the slave trade or the suffering was a result, Brother Tony, of disobedience and God not blessing them because they didn't obey the law. And so that's where our reference back to the God of discipline uh, is applicable because everywhere we see God's discipline, it's not punitive. What do you mean, Brother Williams? He's not trying to punish you. The rod is a rod of correction. It's a nudging. It's a tapping. It's not like you're being whipped by God. And amen. And so even when we get to Deuteronomy 28, 68, and we look at slaves, and we look at slave trade, and we'll even take a look at that in the law, in the Torah, 
and we'll look at the difference between uh, what, what we would consider bond servants in the Hebrew scriptures and that of chattel slavery, which is what we saw in the European slave trade. And so we'll get into that a little bit later, but Hebrews chapter number 12, verse 5 through 11, if you guys recall that, I do want to open it up uh, for some conversation, but we looked at this and we noticed the, the first lesson was the truth of God's discipline. The second lesson was the manner through which God executes discipline, which was instructive and corrective. And then well, we had an open discussion. Uh, what parallels do you see between Israel and the church in regard to God and his discipline? What applica- applications do you take away f- thus far individually or as a congregation? And so we started to look at the why of God's discipline, not because he likes, he delights in doing so, but God found it necessary, necessary, excuse me, to bring judgment upon Israel. We see this in Lamentations, which is that very brief four chapters, which was not necessarily penned by Jeremiah, but Jeremiah was the author. And we know a lament is, is a prayer. I won't, for the sake of time, read this because we've already gone through this, this, uh, this lesson before. Uh, it was not something he wanted to do, Lamentation 3, 31 through 33. It was necessary. He had no delight in it uh, because it was designed to correct us, Hebrews 12, 9. Just as our human fathers do, so we can expect correction from our human fathers. Why not? from our Father, God. Why would we uh, despise the chastising of God? So let's read that, Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh uh, unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourge every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof are all partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they that verily for few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, the fa- nevertheless afterward, excuse me, it yields. We talked about it produces. It, it, it transforms, it creates, it molds, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. One more, what, two more passages and then we'll open up. Again, uh, that you may be partakers of his holiness and our human fathers do it, uh, which seems best to them and our heavenly father does it for a reason that far exceeds Uh, any earthly purpose. So let's open it up right now. I know that there's a lot in there because we we, we talked about not forgetting God, but then we had to pause there in verse 5 because it went from not forgiving, not forgetting God to God chastising. The context is Israel, Moses giving this message to the millennials but we want to make the application for us today. Is there any thoughts or comments about where we're at thus far? What do we see in the text? What application do you have on a personal level or at a congregational level where God might be dealing with you? He might be dealing with me. Sometimes we, we, you know, we have things, we have circumstances and situations in our lives and we don't We don't understand them. You know, are we perhaps in our version of the wilderness where God is trying our heart, he's testing our heart, he's looking to see what we are made of? Any thoughts or comments? 
any thoughts or comments? Brother Tony, what, where, where's your mind at, brother? But Jim, where's your mind at? <clears throat> now, the scripture says God chases the one that he loves. Mm -hmm. So um, knowing that, and you see you go through a rough patch, sometimes we need to examine ourselves and see, have we done anything to bring this upon, upon us? Mm -hmm. Upon us? Mm -hmm. You know, you might be doing something that you're not really fully see that's wrong, mm -hmm. and the Lord, he'll, he'll, you know, he'll, he'll give us a, he'll show us a, 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 I give us a sign, but he'll let us know that we're going down the wrong path. Mm -hmm. He'll give us some warnings, you know. But the question is, do we take those warnings and, and, and turn and go the other way, or we do, do like the Israelites, just do what we want to do. We see the warnings, and we still do, do what we want to do, mm -hmm. and everything, mm -hmm. so... And if we do that, then we should expect the same consequences as the Israelite got mm -hmm. when they was disobedient and didn't heed to the warnings, mm -hmm. you know, of Moses and stuff and everything. So and they just go down to our earthly father and us being fathers, you know, same thing. We, mm -hmm. Our kids, when we get on them, they look at us like we crazy, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, But we're just mimicking what we should be doing, and, and it's for... God do it for us for our goodness for our sake, and we do the same thing for our children, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right for their sake. Mm -hmm. Was it uh, any fun when when your 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 dad or mom had to had to discipline you? I don't think so, huh? Oh no, no. No. Let's go back before we open it up, Brother Keith. Uh, I want to go back uh, to add a little bit more fuel to this conversation. Um, let's go back here. To, to verse 3, because verse 5 talks about uh, um, God chastening. But if we back up to verse 3, he says, And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knowest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Y'all catch that? It's tucked in there. But he talks about Brother Tony, that he wanted to know them. He wanted to, he wanted, uh, I, I'm not going to say the word test, but he wanted to know them. He wanted to see where their hearts were. But then he always also wanted, to, wanted them to know that you don't live off of that manna. You don't live off of the things that you may gain, even if it's from God materially. We still live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And that is where we went over to uh, Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, and I believe, I'm not sure if I put in Luke 4 or Matthew 4, but it's roughly the same thing. This is where Jesus was tempted by Satan. And Jesus quotes Deuteronomy in this passage three different times. Let's read it. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit. Okay, this is Luke because I remember that in verse 1. Remember that, Sister Duncan? And Jesus was what? Filled or full, and he was what? Led. Led. We always, not we always, but when we go to this text, a lot of times we jump right to the temptation of, dev of the devil. But when we read it slowly, we see that Jesus was prepared for the temptation. Why? Because he was full, that's one. And then number two, he was led. He was walking in the spirit. It's okay, Satan, do, do whatever. Do, tip me all you want. He's full of the spirit. He's led of the spirit. Verse two, being 40 days tempted of the devil. What was interesting to me was the correlation between the 40 days that Jesus was tempted and the 40 years that they were in the wilderness. And the 40 days that Moses was on the mountain. And 40 days that Moses was up at Sinai. Amen, Brother Keith. 
<laughs> and in those days, he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. What do we say about the hungerness? It's the physical. He's hungry physically. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written. Where is Jesus quoting? Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter number 8. It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Think about that, brothers and sisters. Think about that. What really sustains you? Is it the pork chops and lamb chops and steaks and burgers? Or is it you and I being in the word of God and living by the word of God, whether you had filet mignon or top ramen? Or what we used to have, uh, the bologna sandwiches with no cheese, Brother Keith. Verse 5. <laughs> and the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in, one, in a moment of time. The devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is what? what? He's quoting Deuteronomy again. Mm -hmm. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Verse 9. And he brought him to what? Jerusalem, and set him on the pinnacle, on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. Now look at Satan quoting, quoting uh, uh, um, scriptures. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him and said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So he quotes, this is the third quote of De in Deuteronomy. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he parted him forever. He parted him till tomorrow. He parted him and never bothered him again. He parted him for a season. And Jesus returned in the power of the what? Spirit. Into where? Galilee. And there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. Now, let's put this back together. So we have this wilderness wandering. We have God trying to see what the people are made of. We have the admonition about chastisement. We have God reminding the people, don't forget about me. And then we have Jesus saying how we are to live. That man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. What does that say to you guys? How do you internalize this? How do you take this home? How do you get through your day? How do you get through the challenge you have in, a ma in your marriage? How do you get through the problems you're having with your children? How do you get through your, 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 your lack of faith because of a medical issue? How do you get through uh, your daily walk with God? How does this help you? Brother Keith, or brother, I'm sorry, Brother Tony. I was going to say um, before coming here, brother was giving a lesson on guarding your heart. Mm -hmm. And so once again, and, and one word he used is focused. Mm -hmm. And so when we are focused mm -hmm. on the word of God, because when we think about our physical bread that we eat doesn't sustain us for eternity. 
when we sit and realize that God is life. God, once again, he gave us life. So in God is life. And so it's like in, 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 so in his words, in what he's teaching us, it's like, look, if you want that life that mm-hmm. I'm offering, it's in my word. And this is what's going to sustain you. Because mm-hmm. when we understand, we're all going to die. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and you can look at it. But then, then your life of where you're going to spend eternity is beginning. Mm-hmm. You know, Amen. and so that so when we look at life, mm-hmm. God said, "Here, look, I'm offering life. I'm mm-hmm. offering you all these things, mm-hmm. but it's in my word that you're going to get this. It's in you know, even when you go back to the part of saying, look, I'm a try. I'm a humble you. I'm I'm, I'm I, I I want to know you, and I want to know what's in your heart. And 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 that's where we see that when people go astray, because God already knows what's in your heart. He didn't make you go that route." But once again, you are hardening your heart against the word of God. You're hardening yourself against the position of God. And understand that in that then, there's death. Because without God, there's, there's only really death. There is no life without God. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. that when we look at that, and we look at it in the sense of God saying death, death mm-hmm. is separation from me. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if, if you're not with me, you're dead. You're dead. That's you right. know, you're, mm-hmm. you're dead. Mm-hmm. You don't have me. You're mm-hmm. dead. Mm-hmm. So in my words, what are my words? My word give you life. Life. Amen. They, 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 it's teaching you mm-hmm. what you need to do to live, yes. to obey, to mm-hmm. be here. Mm-hmm. And so that when we understand that and we understand that God is life, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. then mm-hmm. we can see that that's what he offers. That's what he's giving. Mm-hmm. And once again, when I chasten you, why? Because we already know it's not God's will that any of us perish. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean that we're not because he's not already told us. Yes. Many mm-hmm. are going to take that broad path. That's right. Many are going to be lost mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. even though it's not his will mm-hmm. that he gives us all these chances. Like I was talking to someone today about um, God says, don't take my long suffering mm-hmm. for weakness. Mm-hmm. Because God is long suffering, we get into that lull and relax yeah. ourselves. We, you know, yeah. it's got, like we say, that cra- the crab, you put the crab in the water, mm-hmm. you slowly turn up the water. Mm-hmm. Now, you t- if you just put him in a bunch of hot boiling hot water, water he's yeah. not just going to sit there. Mm-hmm. But when you just, you know, so once again, sometimes we get relaxed mm-hmm. because of God's long suffering until we are snatched. So, Tony, do you think that that's where Moses was going because remember the summation of the chapter. We can if you we just stopped at verse six, but if you keep going seven, eight, nine, all the way to uh, verse twenty, he's talking about the punishments. He's talking about what God has done for them. He's basically the theme of that chapter is don't forget about God. Don't get into that lullness. Mm-hmm. Don't start drifting back into the world. Mm-hmm. Don't allow your own internal doubts. Mm-hmm to impede your faith or belief in what God can do. Because even though you're in year 17 of your 38 years of wandering in the desert, God's still going to bring you to the promised land. Mm -hmm. He's still going to bring you to the point to where you ain't going to need no more manna. And neither are your, your sandals messed up, your feet are not swollen, You have to persevere. We have to persevere. And so there's a lot of meat in this lesson. Uh, I think Brother Keith had his hand up. Yeah, uh, there is a lot of meat. And the title was pretty good because I was on that. That that was in my mindset anyway. Don't forget about me. I was saying, don't forget about God. That's right. Because I like that that we stop right here on chapter, I mean, verse 3. Uh, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that mm-hmm. proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord mm-hmm. does man live. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Come on. God is God is really telling mm-hmm. them, you listen to me. Mm-hmm. You do what I say. That's right. And you shall live. That's Cause, right. Because in chapter 7, he's telling them uh, what he has brought them out of. Chapter mm-hmm. 9, he's going to go in there too. And then he's telling them, if you do what I say, you shall live. It's not the manna I gave you. It's not the quail I gave you. It's not that Moses struck the rock that, you know, he even called, through, even through all this, 
Israel still was stiff-necked as God called them. And then it goes back over, I'm a little ahead of you, Daryl, but God's told them, for all these things I have done for you, these are the things you were saying about backsliding. These are the things that he says, when thou hast eaten and art full, I'm, I'm reading from 8, 810, when thou have eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord, Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. That's a blessing. That's from what God told him, that's what they're going to get. If you follow, if you do, just do with the, every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Mm -hmm. But then the Lord goes, did Moses tell them in uh, verse 17? Oh, are you in chapter 8? Chapter 8. Yeah, we're going to be in 8 next week. Oh, no, we're in 8. Go ahead, Keith. Okay. We're 8 now. I'm sorry. No, I'm I thought in, you were in 9. Uh, okay, I'm on 17. Uh -huh. uh, and thou say in thine heart, thy power and thy might of mine has get have gotten me this wealth. Now mm. that that uh -huh. come on, Keith. That is saying once God has blessed you, because He's saying right up here in uh uh yeah yeah I was I was right I'm on the right frame. You're right on the right track. Okay, yeah. when uh when you have God has blessed you with hmm. your your house, well, come your on. field, your food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, don't take it upon yourself to say, look what I have done. Let me forget about God Let now. Let me forget about God. That's right. Now, I, I did this. I did this. I'm I working. I this. Uh-huh. I sweated my brow for this, you know. <laughs> my feet hurt, you know. Yes. Don't say within yourself that what you have gotten, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is, for it is he, he that giveth the power mm -hmm. to wealth, to get mm -hmm. wealth, that mm -hmm. he may establish mm -hmm. his covenant, which he is aware mm -hmm. until thy fathers, as it is this day. That's do you, 18. That do, you was think, do you think, Keith, that it's easy for people to forget about God? What about you, Sister D? Oh, oh yeah. Do oh, you think yeah. it's easy for people to just get into the rigmarole, if that's still, remember the old folk used to say that, the, the 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 monotony of life. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Get up, go to work, go to work, pay bills, raise children. Get up, go to work, pay bills, raise children. And they get to thinking after a while, when they get a house, they get the second car, they get to travel a little bit, that they have done that. And they begin to forget about God. But you were gonna say something about T? It was good that Keith pointed that out because it's it's that's a good thing once he said focus. Mm -hmm. You know, when, you, when, when he said that word today, and that if we focus, even, you know, like mm -hmm. a lot of times, mm -hmm. we're trying to gain wealth. Mm -hmm. You know, we're trying to get all we can have, that we can have our toys, and not re understanding that, hey, look, God has given us this. I think he was saying for his purpose, when you, um, that he said here, that for it is he that giveth the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, mm -hmm. which he swear unto thy fathers in his day. And so once again, this is, you know, like I said, you have mm -hmm. wealth, but you have wealth for the purpose of God. Mm -hmm. It's not your mm -hmm. own, mm -hmm. you know. And so when we think about the good steward and certain mm -hmm. other things that we do and how God, um, you know, telling us, you know, hey, look, don't just seek after those who can reward you for giving them, mm -hmm. but for those who can't recompense thee and, and things of these kind of manner so that when we sit and understand God, and so it's, it's, it's um, just so good to be reminded of that. Yes, and I think that yes. if we hold on to that, because in this society, when we grow up, mm -hmm. Even you and know, I was thinking about this earlier. Even though we're in the church and we are good parents, mm -hmm. we try to be good parents. Mm -hmm. We always focus on the emphasis of doing well in this society. Yes. And God is secondary. Yes. That's you know, right. and that's, that's one right. of our, our our issues. And it's kind of like we have to refocus. God is primary, mm -hmm. and this is secondary. Mm -hmm. Because if I go back and read that scripture, mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. you try and attain, mm -hmm. God said, "Hey, look." You know, I'm a lift up who I'm a lift up. I'm a, I'm a base who I'm a base. But some of that deals with 
because I know your heart. Mm -hmm. This may not, wealth may not be good for you. Why? Because it's going to cause you to leave <laughs> You're gonna me. You're going to leave me. It's going to cause you to leave me. <laughs> you know, that, that even when we, we look back at Saul, mm -hmm. the Bible in the beginning, Saul was a humble man. At the beginning. In the beginning. In the beginning. Sure but was. with all that power and everything, mm -hmm. he then... That, that, that it changed. Just you can like see Solomon, that. that's right. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at David, mm -hmm. David never forgot God and forgot, you know, mm -hmm. that's why, you know, so when you look at him, even though he did wrong, mm -hmm. David never forgot God. Mm -hmm. He never forgot his position with God and who he was, you know, mm -hmm. just considering even when he went out there to battle Goliath. Mm -hmm. It was all about giving God the glory and being angry that who who do you think you are? Yes. Talking about or talking to the children of God. That's right. In this That's manner. Right. That's right. And so he always mm -hmm. had that. Mm -hmm. He always knew that God was there even when he did wrong. Right. Even in all his troubles and trials he went through. That's right. That God delivered him through that. And that's I think what we need to remember. We 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 don't see God physically as he did certain things for them, mm -hmm. but we have mm -hmm. this. And these should be things that we hold on to, mm -hmm. that we know this. This is the God that I serve. Amen. Amen. This is, yeah, this is the God I serve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's stay with this. And I want to take you guys, because, uh, you know, we're, you know, obviously we're, we're in the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. But the very, very next book is what? Joshua. Okay, yeah, he takes over. He takes over, Sister D. So this group of people that Moses is talking to, Joshua's in the audience. God has been preparing him because remember, if you go back in the Exodus, God told Moses, bring young Joshua up. So God is always preparing a leader. But the, we're, the reason I'm bringing this up, because let's go over to Joshua chapter number one real quick, and we'll just read. Uh, I think uh, I'll know where this stop. I haven't read it in a while, but we'll probably go down to verse uh, 9. But Joshua chapter number 1, the verse number 1. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. If y'all remember, that was, a, that was a sermon that was preached here. I usually go to this passage when I want to uh, preach or teach about succession or about mentoring young people. God is saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. And what we always uh, have to understand, that there was a 30-day mourning period. In, in the, for Moses in the Jewish custom. It's not written in the text, but you, you can, you'll find it in other places. So we have to understand when God said this to Joshua. In other words, God let that period pass, and now he is passing the baton. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people unto the land which I do give to them, even the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses, verse 4. For the wilderness, from, excuse me, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even to the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and unto the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not be any man able to stand before thee all the days of thy life as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Verse 6 is where I really want to go. God said, be strong. Be strong, Joshua. Rahab the harlot is on the other side of that, that Jordan River. Ai is on the other side of that Jordan River. 
You're going to be a man of war. If you go through the book of Joshua, I can't remember the number of the year, but he had three campaigns. Joshua was fighting with Tony to his death. They still didn't conquer all of that stuff. But God is saying, be strong and of good courage. Why? Because you got some battles coming. Be strong and of good courage. For unto this people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Verse 7, he repeats it. Only be thou strong and very... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. God gave him the land. He's fighting the battles, but he knows Joshua is human. He knows Joshua is home. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses the servant commanded thee Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Verse number eight. This is where we talk about because Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, by every word proceeded out the mouth of God. Look what he's saying to Joshua. He's saying, Joshua, be strong, be courageous, but I want you to have my word with you. I want you to walk with me. Verse number eight, he says it. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Thou mayest observe to do uh, according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. If you go back to Shema Israel, Deuteronomy chapter number six, Verse number uh, four through six. Remember, God was telling them, teach to the children, and when they when they when they walking through the way, put it on your lamppost. When they rise up in the morning, my word, my word, my word. Let's go down to verse number nine of Joshua chapter number one. Haven't I now commanded thee the third time? He says, be strong and of good courage. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. God has promised him the victory. God delivered them to the land. God kept his promise right here in front of them, yet he three times he's encouraging Joshua to be strong. Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. I, I, to me, Joshua chapter number one, verse one through nine, man, it's, it's, it's huge because it's the beginning. It's D-Day. It's the time that Joshua gets up from his morning. He is handed the baton. Three times God tells him to be courageous, but God emphasizes his word. He says, don't let it leave your mouth so that you will prosper. And so that's where, again, for, for me, again, we kind of, hung out here in Deuteronomy chapter number 8 a little bit. Um, there was much more as Keith went down to 17 and 18, but the, the, the thesis, if you will, of Deuteronomy chapter number 8 is don't forget about me. I'm talking about God. Don't forget about God. And that should be an application to every one of us today, tonight, as we go through our trials, as we're walking through our own personal wildernesses that we don't forget about God, we stay in his word, and we know that that is what we live by. We live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Any closing comments? I think we're just about two minutes over. I want to be respectful of everyone's time, of course, uh, but I do want to also allow, I was about to go, because Tony mentioned the mind, and I was, we was going to go into Romans 12, a renewed mind, was going, going, going to the one-track mind. We were going to go right there, Tony, because I, I thought that was a beautiful a segue into our mind and our focus and how we are attentive to the word of God and how we are trying to walk. Paul tells um, Ephesians, walk worthy of the vocation in which you were called. And so that was where we were going to uh, go with that, but we're, we're simply out of time. We might pick up on this uh, next week. If not, we're going to uh, continue on. Any final thoughts or comments? And are there any closing prayer requests? Again, prayer good for to Sister see. Sister oh. Debbie Stinson. 
Right? Oh, yeah. Uh, she's going through a whole lot with family. I know her mom. Mm -hmm. um, her dad, I'm sorry. And, um, her dad and mom. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot going on. A and lot. her daughter. Okay. Yeah. Okay. She mentioned that to me on Sunday, too. Yeah. Yeah, so we definitely want to pray for Sister Debbie. Anybody else? Any other prayer requests at all? As I was going to say, it's good to see Brother Tony and Sister Leida back. And uh, Brother Jim, any prayer requests? Okay, pray for the family. Okay. Anthony's traveling, and then, uh, okay. Amen, amen. So, no, he leaves Friday. He's here through Friday. Yeah, he's here through Friday. So it was a blessing to have him back. So I'll go ahead and close this with a prayer. Uh, let's bow our hearts. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, so much for this evening, for this opportunity, just to take one small slice of your word, Lord, and just begin to slow down. And, you know, it's one thing for us to read your word, Father, but it's another thing for us to meditate and internalize it and, and let it speak to us, Father, and let it move us. Let us let it remind us, Father, of why we're here, what we're here for, and it's all to give you the glory, Father. We just thank you so much for sending your son, Jesus the Christ, and what he did, Father, on that cross and how he with, with, uh, withstood, uh, you know, death, hell, and the grave, Father. We're so thankful for you departing unto us your spirit, Father, that guides us into all truth. And we just thank you, Father, for the word that you provided for us, Father, that we can look back and reflect and study and dissect and just try to understand so that we too can be like the Bereans, Father, and be a little bit more noble and a little bit more humble and allows us, Father, to just peek a little bit into your character and what you would have us to do in this time side and how you would have us live our lives and then how you would have us share uh, the good news of the gospel uh, to this dying world. Father, we had some prayer requests. We know of our beloved Sister Paula. We know of Tiffany and Mike. Uh, we know of Sister Stinson. We know of Derek. Uh, we know of our uh, sister that's down in El Salvador. Uh, we know Brother Tariq, Father, is recovering from his knee replacement surgery. Uh, we pray even, Father, for Brother, for brother uh, Dennis. Father, we haven't seen him in a while, but we pray for him as well. We pray for all those that are traveling, Father, and all those that are not here on tonight. And we just thank you for them all, Father. We thank you. We love you. And we love them, Father. And just we'd like to ask you to help us to continue uh, to uh, edify the saints, 1 Corinthians 14, 26, and just be that light, Father, for those that, are, that have an ear and are willing to hear the word of the Lord. Thank you so much, Father. We say this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.